Okay, if you have your Bible, we're going to jump in today to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we're starting our sermon series called Confident Beyond the Shadow of Doubt. So this morning we're starting in Luke 1, and then we're going to next week jump from Luke 1 and leave the remaining chapter, chapter 1 and chapter 2, and start at chapter 3, just so that we've still got some material when it comes to Christmas (laughs) Uh, that we can begin to talk about. And the plan is to go through this almost passage by passage. As we do that this morning, we are just setting the tone. This is just a bit of a foundation, a bit of an introduction to the book of Luke, setting the tone for the journey going forward. And then next week, we're going to jump in and begin to bring out life application points from the book of Luke, starting in Luke chapter 3. So let's open and begin in Luke 1, verse 1. It says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. The gospel that we jump into today is wonderful. It's full of wonders and it's wonderful. Wonderful in its writing, wonderful in its content, wonderful in its style, wonderful in its purpose. Every part of this book is just wonderful. And this gospel is, of course, written by Luke. So a good place to begin today is by understanding right from the get-go, who is this guy whose writings we're going to be exploring together? Who is Luke? And the interesting point that we have to highlight right from the get-go is that Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. In fact, Luke is not mentioned by name or referred to in his gospel at all. He's not referenced, he's not inferenced, he's not mentioned at all. So who is he? Well, while he's not mentioned by name in the gospel, he is mentioned three times in the New Testament. And from those references, we begin to build a picture of the author of our gospel. According to Colossians 4, verse 14, Luke is a doctor. He is a physician. So that means that he's a learned man, an academic, a person who's held in high esteem and respect within his community for the work that he does and for the help that he brings. And therefore, he is in an excellent position to write a gospel. Because he is one who, as a doctor, has to gain knowledge and apply that knowledge to the lives of people. In his everyday job, he has to interact with people's everyday circumstances and situations. So he is one who is able to straddle facts and knowledge as well as the application of those facts and knowledge to people and to their everyday lives and to their everyday circumstances. In short, in his job, he's developed the skill of taking knowledge and making it applicable to life. That's what doctors do. They take medical information, they take medical knowledge, and they apply it to our lives, and they explain it to us in such a way that we understand it and that we can live in the application of it for our good. So who better to write a gospel? Who better to write facts and truths about Jesus in a way that is applicable to our everyday lives? Who better than Luke? Now, as well as that, in Philemon and in 2 Timothy, Luke is introduced to us not as a doctor, but as a fellow worker of Paul. He is one who is close to the Apostle Paul. In fact, he's one of the Apostle Paul's closest friends. And we know that Paul and Luke are close because Paul tells us in 2 Timothy that when all the others have deserted him, when everyone else has given up because things are tough, only Luke remains with him. Luke has stuck it out with Paul through thick and thin like only a best pal would. So we know that they're close. And when we begin to build Luke's CV gleaned from these verses, it reveals to us his qualifications and his ability to write. He is a learned and intellectual man as a medical physician. He is committed to the ministry. He's committed to the teaching of the church, so committed that he has endured even through hard and difficult circumstances. He is a stayer, not a runner. 
He is faithful and devoted to the church, faithful and devoted to the cause of the church, faithful and devoted to the journey of the church. And this means that somewhere along the way, Luke has made a decision about who Jesus is and about what he believes about Jesus. Because when he writes the gospel of Luke, he acts as a narrator. And he narrates from outside the story. He's not one of the disciples. He's not within it. He narrates as one from outside the story. One writing from the outside looking in. But yet that changes because when we come to the book of Acts, which he also writes, he narrates the story from the inside. He's from the inside looking out. In fact, he even refers to himself as a character within the story. So somewhere along the way, he has had a conversion experience and moved from looking in from the outside to looking out from the inside. He's moved from being outside the story to becoming part of the story of Jesus upon the earth. And this is something that we can all identify with. Because none of us were around in the time of Jesus. Let me check that. Jackie, were you around in the time of Jesus? No. None of us were around in the time of Jesus. So we look in on the story of Jesus from the outside. However, having encountered Christ, having put our faith and trust in him, having been filled with the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, we are now part of the story that Jesus Christ is writing upon the face of the earth. We are part of the story of the church, and we each have a vital role to play within it. Amen? Amen? Amen. I'm going to keep doing that. <laughs> now, when Luke writes his story, he writes to someone in particular. He has an audience in mind. And his audience is a guy called Theophilus. Now, you might have guessed that within the kind of theological circles, there is a mixed opinion about who this guy, Theo, really is. One cool theory that preaches really well is that Theophilus isn't actually a person. It's like a pseudonym. And this theory comes from the fact that the word Theo in Greek means God. And the word Phyllis, while being a really cool old person's name, is also Greek for friend. So when you put the two together, it's God friend or friend of God. So some have come to believe that as Luke writes this gospel, he's not writing to an actual person. It's a symbol for all Christians, all those that call themselves friends of God. And that preaches really well. The gospel has been written to all of us who are friends of God to help us understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. It preaches really well, but sadly it just ain't true. Or at least we don't think it is. Because the fact that he's referred to as the most excellent Theophilus leads us to believe that actually he's a Roman official because when Luke writes the book of Acts, he refers to the Roman officials as the most excellent so-and-so and the most excellent so-and-so. So it leads us to believe that this actually is an actual person, a Roman official, a Gentile that Luke is writing to, which is a shame because the friend of God thing was a really cool theory. Now, while understanding who Luke is, and while understanding who he's writing to is quite important, actually understanding why he's writing is the most important. Because it's understanding this that helps us realize and recognize just how blessed we are to have this gospel. How amazing this piece of writing is and how valuable this gospel in particular, the gospel of Luke, how valuable this gospel is to us as Christians today. See, Luke opens his entire 24 chapter book with two very profound sentences. Two sentences that span four verses in the Bible. Two sentences to help us understand the gift that we hold in our hands and the blessing that we're about to explore and unpack together in our journey. These opening lines that we read at the beginning, they are referred to as his prologue. And the prologues of the books in the Bible are in many senses like the back cover of a book or a novel. It's supposed to be a summary or a synopsis that presents to us what the book is all about. And the prologues of books were written with the purpose of ushering the reader from outside the text into the world of the text. They were written to draw the reader in, to whet the appetite, to give a hunger, a desire to read more. 
And in the case of Luke, speeches were the same, or in the time of Luke, rather, speeches were the exact same. Prefaces, introductions were supposed to prepare the audience in such a way that they desired to listen to the rest of the speech, to the content of the speech. Prologues were written so that when you read that, you desired to read the rest of the book. This message, in a sense, is supposed to set the tone and set the foundation that presents to us a desire and a hunger to press in to explore this gospel together. Luke's two-line introduction, when we understand it properly, does exactly all of that. It tells us why we would be wise to read this gospel. It tells us why it is so important that we read these chapters and devour their contents. When we properly understand what is communicated in these two opening sentences, it creates a massive hunger and appetite to read more. It draws us in. It brings us from the outside in. It helps us identify and connect with the gospel writings and draws us immediately into the world of the gospel. It makes us realize just how valuable Luke is. And we thank God for it. You can all too often miss this when we read these sentences because they're not great. They're not much. We kind of skip over them to get to the part where the story actually begins to get told, but we can often miss out the significance of these verses, particularly seen as this prologue isn't quite as poetic as, say, John's. John's gospel opens with words that have almost melody in them. They capture the heart with their sing-song type approach. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling amongst us. And we've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who've come from the Father, full of grace and truth. His summary is, as His gospel continues, it's packed with meaningful language, painting pictures of Jesus with broad strokes, but yet with intimate detail. Whereas Luke's approach, it's not quite the same, is it? He gets more to the point, very matter of fact. He tells us why he's written, what he's written, and how he's written it. His prologue isn't so much poetic as punchy. It's not so much painting with words as just proclaiming purpose. Look again at what he writes. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. Let's take that apart and unpack it together for a moment. The first thing that Luke does is he calls out what was. He identifies the tradition that he's inherited, the foundations for his writings. He says, there have been previous efforts from other people to record and communicate the events of Jesus' life and ministry to a wider audience. He says, many have undertaken to drop an account of the things fulfilled amongst us. And as we read that, what we have to recognize is that Luke describes the life and ministry of Jesus as things fulfilled. He doesn't talk about things that have happened. He doesn't talk about things that have taken place. He describes them as things that have been fulfilled. The language here is really important. It suggests that the things that have happened in Jesus' life and ministry aren't just happenings, they are fulfillments. They are full of meaning. There is meaning in their happening. There is message behind their function, that is prophetic at their foundation. The use of this word fulfilled is pointing to the action and the activity of God because this is how the Bible describes the activities of earth that have heaven's fingerprints all over them. This is the language that the Bible uses when it's describing the things of earth that have heaven's influence at their source. It says these things had to happen so that the scripture could be fulfilled. These things had to happen so that the word could be fulfilled. These things had to happen so that the prophecy could be fulfilled. It's calling out what is taking place in this moment has been filled full of God. And Luke opens his gospel by telling us the things that we're about to read 
the things that have been recorded as happening, well, they have God at their source. They're not stories. They're not gossip. They're not folklore. They're not myth. They're not fable. They're not old wives' tales. They are fulfillments of God, fulfillment of his plan, fulfillment of his purpose, fulfillment of his word. They are filled full of God. And he sets out there what you are about to read as an account of the activity of God. This is God at work. These things are things that actually happen, things that actually had God at their source. Now, how has he come to that conclusion? Because he's not one of the 12. He didn't have a front row seat on all that Jesus said and all that Jesus did. He doesn't write from within the story as one that has witnessed these things firsthand or <clears throat> saw them taking place. So how is he so certain about what he's certain about? How is he so sure about what he's sure about? How has he come to this conclusion? Well, he's sure because he says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things fulfilled amongst us, which have been handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Luke is saying here, there have been many accounts of Jesus' life drawn up. Many accounts that have been handed down to us, and he tells us that he's examined them all. He actually says, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Luke, the physician, who's used to exploring facts in order to gain knowledge. Luke, the intellectual who is skilled in exploring truth in order to gain insight and then bringing what he's learned into the application of people and people's lives. Luke here is telling us that he's taken time to explore and examine the many accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. He has investigated Jesus. He has researched the claims about him. He has looked into the stories of his life and activity and he's done it from the very first. He has went right back to the beginning and carefully and succinctly looked into all that he's heard and looked into all that has been claimed and he tells us how he's done it. He says that he's consulted eyewitnesses and servants of the word. In other words, he's consulted more than one person. He's listened to, spoken to, read more than one account, heard more than one opinion, looked into more than one version of the Jesus story. He's gathered evidence. He's corroborated information. He has examined claims and he's put them alongside other claims and he's done so with information from both eyewitnesses from the beginning and servants of the word. And what that means is that he's spoken to both the disciples and to those out with the circle of the twelve. You see, when he writes the book of Acts, he covers the moment in which Judas is dead, and they come to the conclusion that it's time to appoint someone else to take his place. And Peter speaks to the remaining eleven, and he says, it was spoken of long ago that this would take place, and prophetically it was called out that another should rise up and take his place. And he says, here's how we should do it. Here's the criteria by which we should look for someone else. The person replacing Judas has to be someone who was with us from the very first, from the very beginning. From the baptism by John of Jesus right through to the ascension of Jesus. One that has seen all of Jesus' life and ministry. One that can testify and witness to his resurrection. In other words, he says it has to be an eyewitness from the first. And this is important because what it highlights is that there were people outside the circle of the twelve who witnessed Jesus' life and ministry from the beginning. Very often we think that those who were with him in the beginning, that was just the disciples. But actually, if they were able to appoint one to take his place who'd been with them from the very beginning, then that means that there were those outside the disciples who witnessed all of Jesus' life and ministry. And so Luke tells us right at the very beginning of his gospel that as well as the servants of the word, which we assume to be the 12 disciples, because in the book of Acts they were given over to the teaching of the word, so as well as the servants of the word, he has uh, consulted those who weren't apostles. Those who were eyewitnesses but weren't one of the twelve. Why is that important? It's important because those who were eyewitnesses but not necessarily one of the twelve are those that don't necessarily have a vested interest in keeping the story of the chosen pure. The 
12 disciples you would expect would ensure that they all sang off the same hymn sheet and that their stories were all correct. But those out with that circle had no vested interest to do so. So Luke has consulted, he has interrogated, he has investigated, he has corroborated, he's looked at this from every single angle to create a reliable account of Jesus. And it's believed within theological circles that some of the sources that Luke is referring to here has been handed down are actually some of the other gospels. Because we read their content within here. He says they've been handed down to us, which means that he's one of the us. He's read them. He's looked into them. What's the point here? The point is that Luke has investigated what he's heard about Christ and built his faith robustly upon what he has found out. And he takes, he who takes facts, he who takes truths, he who applies them to people's lives and to people's circumstances, he decided to write an orderly account, which means that that which we have in our hands, that which is written in our Bibles, that which is described as the gospel of Luke is a carefully researched and investigated story of Jesus, which means it's trustworthy. This gospel is tried and tested. This gospel is therefore so incredibly valuable. Luke has forensically interrogated the story of Jesus from the very beginning. And his conclusion is that the happenings of Jesus were actually fulfillments of God. He's looked into it from every single angle. And his conclusion is that these things that took place, <clears throat> they were filled full of God. His conclusion <clears throat> is that God is at work. His conclusion is that the teachings of Jesus were revelations from heaven. His conclusion is that the miracles were manifestations of the kingdom. The healings were signs and wonders in his generation. The lives that were transformed were genuine and true testimonies of faith and salvation. His conclusion is that the death and resurrection of Jesus was real and life-changing. His conclusion took him from looking in on the story from the outside to becoming part of the story, to being transformed transformed by the story to building his entire faith around the validity and truth of the story and being committed to advancing that story to the uttermost corners of the earth even in the most trying of circumstances his conclusion saw him put his faith and trust in that which he knew was reliably true and sincere and his conclusion written down on paper is a gift from God to us amen how amazing is this gospel that we hold in our hands? How amazing is this gospel that we have written down in our Bibles? How blessed are we to be able to read such truths and oh, that in doing so, it would draw us from outside the story to even further within it, that we would give our everything to the cause of Christ like Luke did. So Luke investigates Jesus and he states this. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account. Now, a quick point here is that the English translation doesn't really do look justice here. Because it kind of just suggests that he just decided one day that he'd have a go at writing a gospel. Almost like, well, I've read everyone else's, so I might as well just write my own version. And that's not actually the case. This gospel has not been written out of ego and it's not been written out of self-promotion. Some translations translate that I decided to as it seemed good to me. So it suggests that there was a prompting there that made him seem, this seem good for him. This wasn't, this wasn't just something he plucked. There was something that prompted him there. And, and when you look at the Greek that is used here, the same words are used in Acts 15 verse 28, where it says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So we can trust this gospel, not just because it's a carefully investigated and compiled piece of writing, but because its writing is the result of the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and therefore this gospel carries his influence and it carries his inspiration. This is scripture. This is the word of God. And what we have is what Luke calls an orderly account. 
of Jesus. That is, it's a gospel that brings all the findings of Luke into one overall, orderly, succinct, theological vision of Jesus that we can trust and that we can believe. It's not that everything is in order, as in the order that it happened from start to finish. It's that Luke took everything to present to us an overarching, all-encompassing vision of Jesus that when we read this, we would see Jesus in all of his glory that we would see who he is and what he has done, that we would build a belief and an understanding. And that's the purpose for which it is written because he says, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. And with this we close. Luke writes his gospel, and even although he's investigated everything, even although he's a guy that gains facts and knowledge and brings it to application, Luke writes this gospel not to give information. He's looked into all the facts. He's talked to eyewitnesses and servants of the word. He's examined this from every angle, but he doesn't write this book just to give information. He writes his gospel not to give information, but to give certainty. He says, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know not the facts, not the data, not the information, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. He writes so that Theophilus can take what he's heard about Jesus, bring it against an orderly account that is investigated and corroborated, and have certainty about what is true about Christ. He writes to validate Jesus to his readers. He writes so that those reading his work can establish a firm belief and a reliable foundation in their faith. He writes to bring certainty. And the word used here for certainty means confidence. He writes so that Theophilus can be confident. That he can know. He can be certain. The word that's used here, it means to know that you know that you know that you know. To be sure that you're sure that you're sure that you're sure. In fact, the translation from the original Greek, if we were to take the word and lay this sentence out, it means this, to know without a shadow of doubt. Luke writes this gospel for the sole purpose of anchoring us in Jesus. He writes this so that we can be confident beyond the shadow of doubt who Jesus is, and what Jesus has done. In fact, the word that's used for know, so that you may know the certainty of things, it means to recognize in full. It's the same word that is used in the story of the men on the road to Emmaus when suddenly they recognized Jesus and something like scales fell off of their eyes and they knew without the shadow of doubt whose presence they were in, who they were talking to. This gospel has been written So that as we unpack it and explore it over these next few weeks and months, that the scales can fall off of our eyes and we can recognize in full Jesus, Jesus Christ. So that we can see and we can understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done so that we can be anchored confidently beyond the shadow of doubt in who Jesus is and the fullness of the life that he offers to us. We are blessed with a phenomenal gospel that is given to us to anchor us deep in Christ, that as we read it, we would get a vision of him and be secure in who he is, and therefore in who we are, and we would be wise to devour these words, to take them as a foundation for our faith and build a relationship and experience of Jesus upon these words. We have got an amazing journey ahead of us, don't we? And each and every one of us, we have a part to play. 
in the story of Jesus. And as we unpack this over these next few weeks and months, I pray that this gospel would take us from looking from the outside to being very much part of that story, to understanding and identifying the role and the part that we've got to play upon the story of Jesus Christ upon the earth, that we would identify our part and own it and live it. But you know, one of the things I find quite encouraging when I read these verses is that there may be those of us who are sure and certain in what we believe about Jesus. We've walked the walk. We've been around the block a few times. We know what we believe. That This sermon series will then just reaffirm afresh what we believe. But there may be those who have doubts and questions. And I want to say to you that is 100% okay. It's okay for you to be in this room today. It's okay for you to be in this church with questions and doubts and things you're not sure of. It's 100% all right because that's where Luke was. And he had to investigate and look into it. It's okay for us to investigate and look into things. God does not expect us to have blind beliefs and faith. That's part of the purpose really in saying in our small groups, let's take notes and explore it together. And talk about it because it's not necessarily about the one at the front says, so therefore I believe. It's about exploring and understanding why we believe, what we believe. It's okay to look into that and to investigate it because when we look into Jesus, I can say this with absolute confidence. He will present himself to us. He will reveal who he is and what he has done in a way that will anchor us securely in our faith. So if you have doubts and questions, you are welcome here because Jesus is here. And if you will open up your heart and be open to him, and bring your questions and doubts to him, I am certain he'll reveal exactly who he is in such a way that will ground you in your faith. But you know, this past season that we have been in is one that's been hard. And I can't wait till we get to the point where we stop referring back to COVID all the time, but we're living in it right now. And it may well be that some of the things that we've been through have caused some scales to form on our eyes that maybe our vision of Jesus isn't quite what it once was, or maybe our vision of Jesus isn't quite what it should be. Over these next weeks and months, may we dive into this word and allow him to minister to us in such a way that the scales fall off, that the mist lifts, that the focus sharpens, and we just see him anew that we would get a fresh vision of him. Perhaps we should come and ask him to give us that, eh? Regardless of where we are in the journey, maybe we should say, God, would you just give us a fresh vision of Jesus? But also this past season that we've been in, in fact, the one that we're in right now, everything is so uncertain, isn't it? Everything's so ever-changing and we're not really sure how things are panning out or we can't say what the journey is going to look like. Surely then this is a time when we as a people, individually but together as a church, need to come and be confident about what we're confident about. <laughs> to find that which is never changing. To find the one who is constant and consistent and anchor ourselves afresh in him. Church, let's go on this journey together and let's encounter Jesus as we do so. Let's stand.